and welcome to today's read aloud lesson. Today we're going to continue to focus on relationships, specifically the relationships that our main character has with other characters in our books. So just keep that in mind as we meet another new character in today's chapter. And then at the end, I'll show you some questions that you can ask of yourselves when you're reading your books. Today's chapter is called, If You Can Only Choose One, Pick Carefully. On Wednesday morning, the minivan is gone from the driveway next door, so I busy myself collecting words and phrases for Jason in the blank spaces of my sketchbook. Words from commercials, conversations, and books run between my doodles and across the back of my drawings. The driveway remains empty until after dark. An hour before OT on Thursday, I lay my sketchbook open on my desk and flip the pages, hunting for the right words and phrases to put on Jason's cards. Why not? He already has why, but why not is pushier, like why with a fist on its hip. At my window, I see the minivan still parked next door. Why not? Because mom's calling clients and dad's at work, so David's my responsibility. That's why. Just for an hour, mom said, until we have to leave for OT. I've put on Tom's The Tank Engine video, so he shouldn't be any trouble. I pull forward two blank cards and scroll. Yeah, right? Whatever. I know she needs me to babysit sometimes, but I hate when she tells me he shouldn't be any trouble. Trouble comes quick with David, and should doesn't have anything to do with it. He should remember to flush the toilet, too, but that doesn't mean it happens. When Mom had gone, I took my long mirror off my door and propped it at an angle against one corner of the living room so I could work my desk and still see David reflected in the mirror. Every few words I make, I glance out my bedroom doorway to the mirror. David stands at the TV, the remote in his hand. He loves rewinding the trains backward up the tracks and speeding them ahead to almost crashing over and over. I turn another sketchbook page and choose among the words written along the edge. Sure, you bet. Excellent, perfect, frustrating, pretty, and dazzling. To jazz up and stretch the words Jason has in bigger directions. And joke, so he can be sarcastic if he wants. I peek towards the mirror. The train, the TV train steams ahead, billowing smoke towards the shed. Watch out, David repeats, a perfect imitation of the narrator's voice. But at the last second possible before the smash, David hits pause. Jumping in front of the frozen TV picture, he waves the remote in circles like it's a magic wand. Watch out! On the next page is my half-finished portrait of Jason. I pick up a pencil and add the details I couldn't add in the waiting room. Eyelashes, thick eyebrows, and the outline of his thin lips. Part of me wishes I could tear this picture out of my sketchbook and crumple it into a tight ball so I don't hear his mother scolding in my head when I see it. But the rest of me is bothered that it's incomplete, too much like a secret. Are you busy? A girl's voice asks. I drop my pencil and flash a look from my unmade bed to the folded clothes piled on my bureau. Cinnamon and nutmeg crane their necks so to weak at mom and the girl from next door standing in my doorway. I saw Christy coming up the walk, mom says, smiling. Catherine, I have one more call to make. Could you keep an eye on David for a few more minutes? Then I'll take over, I promise. Before I can get out, no, I see mom's legs in the mirror hurrying back towards her office. David pushes for wine, and Thomas speeds backwards again. Come in, and I offer my chair, but Christy sits on the edge of my desk, crossing her feet at the ankles. Are you busy? she asks. No, and seeing her up close, I know Christy will be popular. Not only for her straight brown hair, parted off center, shining down to her elbows, or because she looks just right, even wearing frayed jean shorts and a t-shirt. Christy radiates cool, and I know it as sure as I know David will stop that speeding train at the last, last second. Part of me feels sorry because she doesn't look like a flashlight and Morse code kid, but the other part of me is excited. I'm glad Mrs. Bauman sold you her house, I say. Well, I guess technically the realtor sold it, but I'm glad your family bought it because I've always thought it would be great if a kid lived next door. Mrs. Bauman was nice, but she was really, really old. I clamp my teeth together to keep anything else dumb from escaping my mouth. Christy drags a strand of hair between her fingers. I'm glad, too. I was scared I'd have to start school next year without knowing anyone. My lips spread to a smile, imagining Melissa's surprise as I introduce Christy into our group. This is my friend Christy, I'll say. We hung out together all summer. I glance out my doorway to the living room. Where's David? Ryan said there's a bus stop at the end of the street. I lick my bottom lip to keep from grimacing at the corner. That's great. Christy continues to twist her strand of hair. 
I used to walk three blocks to catch the bus, even when it was freezing or raining. Mom would say, take the umbrella, as though anyone carries an umbrella. David insists on bringing his bright red umbrella to school, even when it's only cloudy. My mom's like that, too. Leaving out isn't the same as lying. She's always She always says, well, at least wear your hood. I continue, like I'd want hood hair. Christy smiles, letting the twisted strand fall back to her arm. Ryan said he lets kids wait in his house when it's raining, since he can see the bus stop from there. But only if you're invited. I peek out the doorway into the empty living room. Part of me would like to tell Christy the truth, but I don't want our conversation to become about David. At the bus stop, I always tell him, you have your umbrella, grabbing the back of his jacket to keep him from following Ryan's friends up the steps. Going inside is for kids without umbrellas. I would be honest, but David doesn't understand invited and not invited. He thinks everything is for everyone. Ryan's nice, Christy says. Don't you think so? Yeah, nice as a cockroach. Want some sherbet, I ask. When you want to get out of answering something, distract the questioner with another question. What kind? Christy asks. Raspberry. David rushes through my doorway, his eyes wide with panic, an audio cassette in his hand. Fix it? The tape had pulled out of the cassette, hanging in a long, delicate loop. At first, I'm relieved that all that's wrong until guinea pigs start to squeal. With the cassette over one ear and his hand shielding the other, David yells, Quiet, pigs! Christy shoots a word glance from David to the guinea pigs to me. I pry the cassette from David's fingers, knowing it'll be faster to deal with the tape than the tears filling his eyes. Don't worry, this will only take a minute. I spin the cassette around and around on my finger, wishing I had two more hands. One to give the guinea pigs hay to quiet them, another to cover David's mouth as he shrieks. I spin the cassette so fast my finger keeps slipping out of the tiny hole. When the tape lies flat and tight, I slide, frong a toe together into my cassette player and push play. Arnold Lobel's deep voice joins the guinea pig squeals and David's face lights up like Christmas morning. Halloween night and his birthday all rolled into the big grin. You fixed it. Go find mom, I say, pressing the cassette into his hand and tell her I'm done babysitting. Before I close the door, I peek into the living room to see David's heading towards Mom's office. He disappears down the hallway, swinging his arms. That must be hard, Christy says. Even regular little brothers are a pain. Regular? Snarls in my stomach. I grab my sticky notes and write, Dad, buy a new tape player, and stick it on the back of my door to remember to tell him. Again. To quiet my guinea pigs, I pull strings of Timothy hay from the little bale I keep under the cage. Nutmeg yips as Cinnamon steals her hay. They're so cute, Chrissy says. Can I hold them? Sure, I toss her a towel. Better put that on your lap in case they pee. I slide one hand under Nutmeg's chest and cup her back legs with my other. Cinnamon weeks until I set her next to Nutmeg on Christy's lap, and the squealing turns to happy big cooing. Happy pig cooing. Nutmeg, I thought I'd never see you again. Say, what are you eating? Towel, medium rare with a hint of fabric softener. Care for a bite? Don't mind if I do. My door bursts open. No toys in the fish tank, David announces. I'll be right back, I say to Christy between my clenched teeth. No problem, she says, stroking Nutmeg's neck. I close my door behind me so Christy won't see me run. Why? I sprint out of David. Why today? Because. A tiny cowboy stands bow-legged on the gravel at the bottom of the fish tank, one hand poised to grab his pistol, the other holding the end of a lasso hovering in a loop above his head. A goldfish swims right through the hole. Get back here, you peaky varmin. Plunging my hand into the water, fish swoop past my fingers. I rescue the cowboy and throw him into the toy box. Grabbing David's wrist, I don't even wipe my hand first. Wet! David twists to get away. You're not going to ruin this for me. And I yank him along behind me down the hallway to Mom's office. She's on the phone. All right then, Mom says into the receiver. I'll look forward to hearing from you next week. I have company, I say, not caring about interrupting her, and you need to watch David. Mom holds up one finger for me to wait, but I push David ahead of me into the room. Her eyebrows come down. She grabs a puzzle off her bookshelf and dumps the pieces on the floor. Yes, that'll be fine, she says into the phone. David sits behind the hill of pieces. He can't stand to see, puzzles undone, but he insists on doing the pieces and lines like he's reading the puzzle. He doesn't look for all the red barn pieces or the daisies in the field or the glimmers of sunlit water. Left to right, top to bottom, that's his puzzle rule. And if you add a piece out of David's order, he'll take it back out, even if it fits. I slam Mom's office door on my way out. When I come back to my room, breathless from running down the hallway, I notice Nutmeg and Cinnamon are in their cage again. Everything okay? 
Christy asks. I hope you don't mind that I looked at this. She's holding my sketchbook, open to the half-finished portrait of Jason. Is he your boyfriend? No, just a boy I started drawing. Christy tilts her head in it. Oh, really? Look. If you want someone to think someone's not important, just use just a lot. He's just a boy I know from, well, I don't really know him. Not very well. I just see him at, I check my watch. It's almost time to leave for OT. I can't tell Christy I have to go. Not the first time we've met, but I told Jason I would see him today. Christy tosses my sketchbook onto my desk. My hands itch to flip the page, but that'll bring attention to it. Want to watch TV? Christy asks. If I say no, maybe I won't get another chance to hang out with her. I glance at a Thomas the Tank engine reflected in my mirror. His eyes closed, braced for a crash that'll never happen. From somewhere, David shrieks. We could watch at my house, Christy says. That stings, even if I agree. Sure, I say. I'll tell my mom. All the way up Christy's walkway, I want to skip or run or twirl with my arms out like a six-year-old. It feels del deliciously easy to be visiting a friend's house without having to say first. Sorry, David, this is for me. You can't come. Hearing mom's car back out of the driveway, I turn to wave. She waves, but David sits alone in the back seat, hunched down, his hands over his ears. I follow Christy up the steps and through her front door. All right, so let's take a look at this doc that I created to track character relationships. Okay, so it's really important to track our characters and the relationships that they're developing with other characters. We know that authors purposely put our minor and, char and secondary characters in their stories for a reason. So some questions to ask while we're reading are, do these relationships help the main character work through the problems they are facing? Or do they add to the problems in the story? Another question you can ask is, how do these characters impact the plot? So I'm going to take a look at Catherine's relationships. Now she's developing many relationships in this story friendships, families, neighbors. So let's take a look at this chart that I created. I chose to include David, her brother, Jason, the boy from the clinic, her mom, and Christy, her new neighbor. So I had to look at each of these relationships individually and ask myself, what is going on with this relationship? Is it adding to Catherine's issues? Is it changing the way Catherine thinks about issues? Or is it just adding more to the issues that she's dealing with? So we know that David is her younger brother. And unfortunately, he's adding to Catherine's issue of longing for acceptance. But at the same time, this relationship will teach Catherine a lot about herself and the world around her. So although she's frustrated with her brother at times, she really can learn a lot through him. And Jason, through this friendship, Catherine develops a deeper understanding of those who long for acceptance. She sees firsthand through David what Jason is also dealing with, and that makes her more empathetic. Her mom, it seems that they have a great relationship, but her mom adds to the fact that she feels left out. She just wants to be noticed by her family, and we know that her parents spend so much time on David and give him so much more attention. And then we have Christy who Catherine interacts with for the first time in this chapter. So far, Christy is adding to Catherine's longing for acceptance. She wants to impress Christy so badly. She overthinks every part of their interaction, and she even chooses to go to Christy's house instead of going to OT with David, leaving Jason hanging. So today, while you're reading, it's really important to analyze the relationships in your books and ask yourself, how are these relationships impacting the main character? I hope you're keeping track of these because tomorrow this will be our topic. Actually, today is Thursday, so this will be our topics in our book club conversations today. See you then. Bye.